a white house with bushes on both sides of the entrance, a wood-framed house with a green roof and twin chimneys, a red clapboard house with black shutters. These houses in Fall River, Massachusetts, resemble many others in the city, but in fact, they are no ordinary places. All were once stations on the Underground Railroad, the secret network that helped thousands of slaves escape their masters during the Civil War era. The Underground Railroad was a, a system, usually in the northern states, to assist uh, runaway slaves from who were coming from the south and needed either uh, financial or physical assistance to reach the Canadian border and then to freedom in Canada. Nationally, the Underground Railroad was in service uh, from about eight, the early 1830s up until the Civil War. Members of the Underground Railroad concealed runaway slaves in their homes and helped them move from one hiding place to the next as they traveled north. Secrecy was essential, so they spoke in code. Slaves were called passengers or cargo, and the places where they were hidden were called stations or safe houses. The people who ran the safe houses were known as conductors or station masters. It is no surprise that the Underground Railroad made its way through Fall River. Whether for religious or humanitarian reasons, many citizens of the city were ardent abolitionists. Starting in the 1830s and continuing throughout the next three decades, they endeavored to stop slavery, and Fall River became an important center on the Underground Railroad. A thousand people met in 1834 at the Baptist Meeting House to establish the Fall River Anti-Slavery Society. Anti-slavery lectures, concerts, and fairs were held. Groups including the Anti-Fugitive Slave Law Society and the Anti-Slavery Sewing Circle were formed, although not without resistance. Abolitionist Elizabeth Buffum Chase told of a protest in her book, Anti-Slavery Reminiscences. We organized a female anti-slavery society at Fall River about the year 1835. In the village, were a few very respectable young colored women who came to our meetings. One evening, soon after the society was formed, my sister and myself went to them and invited them to join. This raised such a storm among the leading members that for a time it threatened the dissolution of the society. We maintained our ground, however, and the colored women were admitted. Runaway slaves usually came to Fall River from New Bedford after being smuggled out of Virginia on commercial sailing ships. They would be fed and kept overnight before moving on to Rhode Island, Vermont, and Canada. The route for the Underground Railroad locally ran from Virginia in the south to New Bedford or Cape Cod to, uh, to uh, towns on Cape Cod to New Bedford uh, to Fall River out toward Providence and up through Vermont to Canada. That was the, the route in New England. Uh, there was also another route uh, that led north from Fall River through, through Steep Brook and then up and over toward Cumberland, Rhode Island. Activity on Fall River's Underground Railroad was at its height in the mid-19th century. Up until then, slaves who escaped their masters were able to live in states such as Massachusetts where slavery was prohibited. But the Fugitive Slave Act, passed in 1850, made escape from slavery a federal offense and authorized slave hunters to go north to search for runaways. Slaves who were captured were branded, flogged, imprisoned, or sold back into captivity. Some were even killed. Conductors on the Underground Railroad now faced serious consequences. Anyone caught feeding or sheltering runaway slaves was subject to a fine of $1,000 and six months in prison. After the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, they, they, um, the uh, punishment became a lot stricter. While it was rare, there were agents that were sent from the north to the south to actually recruit people uh, as, as runaways. And in Delaware, there was one um, agent from the north, an abolitionist, who was caught and murdered so they were, you know, these type of, of occurrences did, did occur. Elizabeth Buffum Chase and her husband ran a safe house in Valley Falls, Rhode Island. She described the fear they experienced 
when they sheltered a female slave. She had escaped from Maryland some time before with her family and established herself at Fall River as a laundress, had made herself a home and was doing well. Her eldest boy of 17 years worked in a stable and after a while had gone six miles away to work for a farmer. Soon after, an officer who had captured a runaway slave in Boston arrived in Fall River and began prowling around the stable where the boy had worked. Fearing for the safety of the laundress and her family, members of the Underground Railroad intervened. They hurried this woman off with her three children in the darkness of night to await at Valley Falls, the disposal of her household effects and bringing of her son from the farmers. We kept them three or four days in hourly fear and expectation of the arrival of the slave catcher, our doors and windows fastened by day as well as by night, not daring to let our neighbors know who were our guests, lest someone should betray them. We told our children all at that time, under 14 years of age, of the fine of $1,000 and the imprisonment of six months that awaited us in case the officer should come. On the third or fourth day, the boy arrived with money from the good friends at Fall River, and we sent them off, still fearing their capture on the road. Chase also described a disguise used to save a male slave who had escaped from Virginia with his wife and child. The man had been living in New Bedford for almost a year when his former master tracked him down and began pursuing him. The man was hurried off to Fall River before the man-stealers had time to find him, and the friends there dressed him in a Quaker bonnet and shawl and sent him off in the daylight, not daring to keep him until night, lest his master should follow immediately. The rescue was successful much to the disgust of the master, who complained that New Englanders were indifferent to his interests. Because of the need for secrecy, very little information is available about safe houses and their station masters. We do know that there were at least six stations in Fall River where slaves found help and protection. The people who ran them were a diverse group of city residents with little in common except for their ideals and their courage. Among them were an abolitionist mayor, a postmaster, two school teachers, a doctor, a well-to-do businessman, and an eccentric newspaper publisher. The best-known safe house belonged to Nathaniel Briggs Borden, a community leader with interests in banks and railroads who served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives and the State Senate. He was the third mayor of Fall River, elected first in 1856 and then again in 1857. Borden married into a family of dedicated Underground Railroad conductors when Sarah Buffum, one of the founders of Fall River's Female Anti-Slavery Society, became his wife in 1843. The couple's house served as a transfer point to Sarah's sister. Slaves in Virginia would secure passage, either secretly or with the consent of captains, in small trading vessels and thus be brought into some port in New England where their fate depended on the circumstances into which they happened to fall. A few, landing in some town on Cape Cod, would reach New Bedford and thence be sent by an abolitionist there to Fall River to be sheltered by Nathaniel B. Borden and his wife, who was my sister Sarah, and sent them to Valley Falls in the darkness of night an enclosed carriage with Robert Adams, a most faithful friend, as their conductor. The Borden's house on 2nd Street is no longer standing. The Academy building in downtown Fall River was constructed as a memorial to Nathaniel Borden in 1875. Squire William Bonibus Kennedy, born in 1784, was a postmaster in the Steep Brook section of Fall River. His house was a station on an underground railroad route that led to Cumberland, Rhode Island. Kennedy served in the state legislature and was the father of 13 children. After his death in 1855, three of his daughters continued his work. Betsy and Ann Kennedy went south to teach the children of freed slaves near the end of the Civil War. Mary Kennedy and her husband, Albion King Slade, 
managed to operate a station even though they did not own a house. From 1857 to 1861, Mary and Albion, both school teachers in their 30s, were tenants in a double house on Pine Street. Working from their rented rooms, they took in runaway slaves and hid them in their landlord's basement. Mary at one time was an assistant editor of the New England Journal of Education, and she wrote the lyrics to several pieces of music. When a local official became suspicious of the Slades, she used her way with words to distract him. Her granddaughter, Annie Malcolm Slade, recalled the incident. The sheriff came to investigate, but Mrs. Slade received him as a social caller and talked so industriously about everything but slavery that she got him out of the house without him remembering what he came for. Several prominent men in Fall River adopted resolutions urging the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law. One of them was a homeopathic physician named Isaac Fisk. He was a devout Quaker. My father was a great reformer and anti-slavery, women's suffrage prohibition man. All these objects held his sympathy and consideration. The noon hour, when I came home from school, held many surprises for me. There might be an escaped slave of the house on his way north to freedom in Canada, whose presence must be mentioned with bated breath. Henry Box Brown, a well-known fugitive who was active in an anti-slavery lecture circuit between Providence and Boston, is believed to have been one of the people who was sheltered in the Fisk House. Brown escaped from slavery in Virginia at age 33 by having himself mailed in a wooden crate to abolitionists in Philadelphia. The Fisk House is located in Fall River's National Historic District. The Preservation Society of Fall River recently purchased the house and plans to restore and maintain it. Andrew Robeson Jr.'s story illustrates the resourcefulness and collaboration that characterized the Underground Railroad. Born in 1817, Robeson was a prominent businessman who worked with two well-known Quaker operatives, Robert S. Adams and William Hill Sr., to help slaves trying to reach Canada. Robeson converted a wine cellar in his mansion into a hiding place, and in 1843, Adams camouflaged the entrance to it by building a bookcase, complete with books with fake bindings. Slaves on the run were smuggled into the secret room, and when it was time to move them on to their next stop, Adams transported them in closed carriages under cover of night. On February 18, 1854, Robeson sent a letter to Nathaniel Briggs Borden about an escaped slave whose former master was offering a large reward for his capture. I could not think of any better plan than sending him to Fall River, Robeson wrote. We are collecting some money to help him on the way, and if we don't get enough just now, we will do more when I see you. The Robeson residence was later moved to 451 Rock Street. It is now home to the Fall River Historical Society, where the entrance to the secret room can still be seen. Abraham Bowen and his wife ran a grain shipping business in the 1840s and used the revenue to finance secret anti-slavery networking at their home. In 1843, Bowen served on a committee that made a bold gesture to express their sympathy for American slaves. The committee members resolved to wear badges of mourning as they marched at a 4th of July celebration. Yeah, he was a strange guy. He, um, he, had, he was independently wealthy because his ancestors were farmers where, where um, you know, entrepreneurs wanted to build their mills. So his ancestors automatically became share, had shares in, in, in the textile industry, and that generated enough income for him who was a descendant, either son or grandson, to do what he wanted, and which he did. Um, that was a, a Bowen house, 175 Rock Street, and um, which is also considered a station on the Underground Railroad. Now, he was a free thinker, and he published a newspaper called The All Sorts, 
which was like a sort of undergroundish alternative news to, I guess, the established papers in, in, uh, in Fall River, which was very popular because it had a lot, a lot of local gossip and, you know, news that you wouldn't ordinarily be carried uh, by the regular press. And he tried a number of, of, of occupations just to occupy his time. And he was described as, as uh, quite a figure. He had uh, shoulder length hair and he used to wear a shawl and he used to walk through town, you know, like, in, you know, and people commented on his appearance because that was not fashion, fashionable to, you know, to look like that. But, you know, he, he made his mark in Fall River and he opened his home to fugitives running, you know, people seeking freedom in Canada, you know. So he was also one. And he also figured prominently in, in you know, holding meetings and setting up and organizing meetings, a lot of which were at City Hall anti-slavery meeting so you saw his name even in the establishment press in Fall River. Slavery in the United States was abolished on January 31, 1865 when Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. The Underground Railroad was no longer needed and the secret work of Abraham Bowen and the other station masters came to an end. What was the full extent of Fall River's role in the anti-slavery movement? That question cannot be answered. But historians believe that there were more than six safe houses in the city, and the few records that are available reveal a broad and deep commitment to helping American slaves live freely. There were six known, but I'm, I'm sure there were a lot more. Uh, I'd say maybe more like 10 or 15, you know? Well, the thing to, to, to remember about the stations is that these places weren't set in stone. It was sort of very, very fluid. It was sort of like um, rain on a window pane. It was like you have all these rivulets and whatever, whoever could act as an agent or a station did it because the opportunity was right for them to do it. So you have, in, in addition to the core people, you had multiple people who were willing to do this. Consider an anti-slavery fair held in 1831 in Fall River that raised $300, now the equivalent of approximately $9,000. Reporting on the event in his newspaper, Bowen wrote, Fall River people are not slow in doing the handsome thing in support of a good cause. Today, more than 180 years later, those words are still a fitting way to describe Fall River's role in the Underground Railroad.